This morning, I would like to read for you a, uh, a very familiar account in John chapter 4 of Jesus with the woman of Samaria, and that we might uh, focus on what it is we were looking at, and that is Jesus' love for the Father and His desire to serve Him. Uh, here, Jesus will express that desire as something that is stronger than even His desire for His necessary food. Now, what I'd like to do, though, is read the, uh, well, the account of the woman at the well, just to remind us, too, of what Jesus was all about. Again, we see Jesus doing certain things, and we say, oh, well, that's Jesus doing that. That's what He was called to do. He's the Son of God. He came into the world uh, to bring about our salvation. But what He does really doesn't have any relevance for me, except that He was doing that for me. Well, don't forget, this is an example of what He wants you and me to do. Even though there's not going to be, we're not going to go to Samaria and meet a woman at the well, uh, we, we do need to communicate the gospel to other people uh, so that they might be saved, that they might experience these rivers of living water. So let's read about that account, and again, let's be encouraged to follow the example of Jesus Christ because in doing what He was doing here, He was fulfilling the first or the greatest commandment as well as the second commandment. But we're going to focus on the first, the greatest Okay, so John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, and I'd like to read through verse 42. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus Himself was not baptizing, but His disciples were, He left Judea and went away again into Galilee, and He had to pass through Samaria. So He came to a city of Samaria called Sychar near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, Ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked Him and He would have given you living water. She said to Him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water, so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. He said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you have now is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming. When neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be His worshipers. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. At this point, his disciples came and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and were coming to him. 
Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying to one another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal, so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. From that sin, many of the Samaritans believed because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all the things that I have done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. Again, let me just draw your attention to the heart of our Lord Jesus Christ in seeking to do the will of His Father. It was His food, it was His drink, that is what He was all about. And again, not just to be our Savior, but to be our example. And that's what we want to consider uh, this morning. Now again, last week uh, we were reminded of what eternal life really is. It's not, again, just uh, knowing, as it were, uh, something of the blessings of God in this world, knowing that we're on our way to heaven, knowing that we're safe from hell, uh, knowing that we're going to live forever in heaven. But it is actually represented by Jesus Christ in John chapter 17, verse 3, as a relationship, uh, as knowing the Father and knowing the Son. Now, remember, we saw that Jesus came into the world to preach the gospel so that we might know of Him. Uh, he gave us His Word so that we might know about Him. And again, we don't want to stop there because Jesus isn't just a figure in a book and just a person to be studied, but He is somebody that we are to come to know in a personal way, and we do that by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ but somebody that we are to know beyond that in a more intimate way, to know what it is to really experience the life of Christ in our own lives, to experience that power that Paul was talking about in Philippians chapter 3, and to experience the suffering that comes from actually living like Jesus Christ lived. Jesus came that we might know all of these things so that we might better love Him, that we might better serve Him, that we might better glorify Him. So it's important not only to know of Him, it's, not, it's important not only to know what He's like or even to know Him personally, but actually to enter into His experiences. But in order to do that, we need two things. We need to know about Him, that's why it's important that we do study Him, but we also need His Holy Spirit. That's what takes us from being unbelievers to believers. That's what takes us from being in death to life, in darkness to light. And that spirit, if he is in us, will be transforming us into the image of Jesus Christ. So the question we need to ask is this, what was Jesus like? What is this image that you are to be growing into? Well, the first thing we want to look at, and again, there's a number of things, but what we want to focus on this morning is his love for the Father. What is Jesus like? Well, perhaps the most prominent thing about Him is that He loved His Father most of all, with all of His heart and His mind and His strength and His soul. Jesus loved Him and served Him with His whole being. So if you would know Jesus Christ, if you would know His life in you, if you know what it is the Spirit of God is seeking to produce in you, you have to realize that this is where it begins. You are to love God, the Father, most of all. And by the way, Jesus being God in human flesh, His love was directed towards His Father, not towards Himself. 
our love needs to be directed towards the Father and the Son, and that's what the Spirit of God will do in us. So we need to love Him most of all, and secondly, we need to serve Him because that is how our love is demonstrated, and the level of our service is the way it is measured. The more we love Him, the more we will serve Him. And again, we see that in the life of Jesus Christ. Now again, reminding ourselves first of all that Paul says that you and I were predestined to become like Jesus, to be conformed into His image. The greatest part of that image is loving God most of all. That's what Jesus did. Now I hope you realize that that's not something that Jesus started to do when He came into the world. That's something that He has always done. Remember, He is the Son of God from all eternity. He is the one who is eternally begotten. Jesus refers to Himself on one occasion in John chapter 1, verse 18, as the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. You've read that before, I'm sure, but I, I wonder if you've ever thought about what that means. Well, He's not just the begotten Son in time, but He is the begotten God. He's the eternal Son of God, eternally uh, generated, we say, by the Father, something that didn't happen in time, but in eternity He has always been. But what I want, you to, what I want to draw your attention to is the fact that He's in the bosom of the Father. What does that mean? Jesus is in here? You know, like the Father has a body and Jesus is... No, no. He's talking about in the love of the Father. Wrapped up as it were. Bosom refers to, of course, you know, the, like bowels and so forth. It refers to affection. He is the one that the Father has loved with all that He has to love throughout all eternity. And Jesus, of course, has returned that love from all eternity. They have always delighted in one another. Now, we know something of what it means to love somebody. And we know what it means to be, as it were, intensely in love with someone when you love someone with your whole heart. When that happens, you want to be with them. You're, you're thrilled to be able to spend time with them. Uh, they're all that you think about. Well, that's what the father and son's love is like. You know, their, their thrill, their delight, their desire to be with one another and their thinking about one another, only their love is infinitely strong and has been going on throughout eternity. Now, you know, I, I couldn't resist, but as you know, I'm, I'm working on a paper that's dealing with Jonathan Edwards and his view of the marks of grace and how they're related to the Holy Spirit. Well, this love the Father has for the Son and the Son has for the Father uh, is what Edwards believed gives rise, as it were, to the person of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is the love of God. We talk about in Christian theology the idea of the eternal procession of the Holy Spirit, how you know, the Father is called the Father because He begets the Son. The Son is called the Son because He's begotten of the Father. And the Spirit is called the Spirit because He's breathed out by the Father and the Son. And we've, you know, theologians have tried to understand what does that mean? It's something that God has told us in His Word, uh, names that He gives Himself, uh, the different persons that is in the Godhead, but they, they mean something. And so we've tried to understand what that means. And we understand, well, Jesus is eternally begotten and the, the Spirit of God is eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son. Well, Jonathan Edwards believed that this eternal procession of the Spirit, this breathing out of the Spirit by the Father and the Son is really the love that they have towards each other, that intense, infinite, eternal love that it gives rise to the Spirit. The Spirit's primary fruit that He produces in our lives is love, which is why He is called the love of God. And we're going to see the importance of that in just a moment. Now, the point behind this is this, that if you would know Jesus Christ, if you would experience His life in you, if you would be conformed to His image, this is the kind of love that you must have for God, for the Father and the Son. And this is the kind of love that you are to be cultivating in your life because you know as well as I do, uh, becoming more like Jesus Christ is not an automatic thing. It requires a great deal of effort uh, from on our part. You need to delight in them. 
As a matter of fact, if you're a Christian, if you have the Spirit of God, you already have something of this. You do delight in Him. You do want to be with them. You are excited about your relationship with them. And certainly, you do want to spend time. I, I hope that's one of the reasons why you're here is because you want to spend time with the Lord. They are on your mind and in your heart and thrill you more than anything else. Now, again, that's what the Spirit of God produces in the hearts of His people. If you have the Spirit of God, this is what you're experiencing this morning, at least to some degree. And so let's begin by asking that question. Do we really love the Father and the Son in this way? Well, again, if you've received grace and mercy, you have. Jesus, in His high priestly prayer, the very last verse, John chapter 17, verse 26, He prays that the Father, the love with which the Father has loved Him, would be in them, that is, those whom the Father had given Him, those that Jesus knew and Jesus, uh, those whom the Father would give Him through their testimony. He was praying for you and for me in that priestly prayer, and He says that that love, Father, with which you have loved me from all eternity, I pray that that love would be in them and that I would be in them. It's interesting that Jesus dwells in His people by the Holy Spirit. He prayed that that love would be in them. The Spirit of God is that love. Jesus came into the world so that He might give you His Holy Spirit, that you might be able to love the Father and the Son in this way. That's the reason why you came to Jesus in the first place, is because Jesus gave you His Spirit and He gave you that love. That's the reason why you want to spend any time at all with God. Why, when you die, you want to be with Him, not just to avoid the flames of hell, but because you really love Him and you want to be with Him because His Spirit dwells in you. Now, as I've said, if you're a believer and you have the Spirit of God in you at all, you have this kind of love. But why isn't this love stronger than it is in your soul? Well, maybe it's because you haven't been cultivating that love the way that the Lord tells you to do. You know, I, I have a, <clears throat> a battery pack that's connected to this microphone, and we saw, I think it was a couple Lord's Days ago, what happens when it runs out of power, right? Uh, thankfully, I wasn't wearing it at the time, but the person who was wearing it <laughs> actually drained two power packs. Well, the mic runs out of power and it stops working. If you don't recharge the batteries, it just doesn't do what it's supposed to do, right? Well, if you don't recharge the batteries that are in your soul, you know, the, the, the influence of the Spirit of God, by using those means that God provides for you, well, then you're going to stop working too. Your desire is going to weaken. Thankfully, it'll never be extinguished. Uh, you have a battery in you, as it were. You have the Spirit dwelling in you. He's connected to you for life, and He's never going to let you go. But that doesn't mean that you can't struggle that doesn't mean that you can't become weak. That doesn't mean that you can't actually be, get into a state where you don't even know whether you know them or not. You know, I mean, when you're struggling with your assurance because you just don't have that power. Well, how do you prevent that? And how do you strengthen that love so that you not only can honor Him more, but you can know that you are a believer? Well, you need to spend time with Him. You need to spend time in His Word. You need to spend time in prayer you need to spend time with His people. You need to spend time in His service. If you do these things, it will charge you spiritually and you will become stronger. So you have to do this if you're to charge your spiritual batteries. By the way, I should, I should mention this too because I hadn't included this, but I know it's true in my own life. Sometimes your spiritual struggles don't even come from your, your spiritual well-being, but they come from your physical lack of well-being. You need to make sure that your body is as healthy as you can make it too, and you'll, you'll be surprised at just how much your spiritual life will improve. Because of that connection between soul and body, it can drag you down. Actually, even being spiritually, you know, having spiritual struggles and illness can drag your body down, but having a sick body can drag your soul down. So both of them need to be healthy. Well, anyway, getting back to this, though, you need 
to use those means God has given you in order to charge your spiritual batteries. But you also need to avoid the things that drain you of spiritual power. You know, if I leave this mic on all week long, when I come to use it on Sunday, it'll be drained, right? It won't have any power, so it's not going to work. Well, there are things that can drain you of spiritual life and spiritual power, things that will weaken that love in you, besides not charging your batteries through the means God has given, and that is by charging the other battery that exists in your soul. Sadly, there is something else in us that can draw power, that draws power from the world. And when you spend time in the world, you feed that principle, you feed that power source. And when you do that, it weakens the influence of the Spirit. And that, of course, that other battery is called your flesh. The more you drink from the world's fountain, the more you listen to its message, the more you desire what it has to offer, the more you spend time with the people of this world, the more you give yourself to serve your own pleasures and lusts or to serve the world, the more you strengthen your flesh and the more you weaken the Spirit's influence in your soul and the less you love God and the less you are like Jesus and sadly, the more you're like the devil, the more like your enemy. Now, obviously, that's counterproductive. That's not what you want if what you want is to be like Jesus. You can't do this. It sets you back. It stunts your growth. It brings you back to square one more quickly than you would imagine that it could. The Spirit's work is a very precious thing. Jesus had to live and die to give you His Holy Spirit. He is absolutely essential to your growth in grace and your growth in love. And so you should do everything you can to increase that influence and you should do everything you can to preserve what you get through those means by not grieving and quenching the Spirit. And you need to do everything you can to drain and kill the power of your flesh and your soul. You know, the body, or excuse me, uh, Paul says in Romans chapter 3, that, or excuse me, Romans chapter 8, verse 13, that if you are not putting to death the deeds of the flesh, that those things will actually kill you. Now, of course, if you have the Spirit of God, you will be doing that. If you don't have the Spirit of God, you won't be doing that, which is why they will kill you. So you can know you have the Spirit of God by whether or not you're fighting against your sins and seeking to put them to death. You need to do that. Now, again, even as a believer, if you don't do that and it gets stronger, you will struggle and you won't love the Lord and serve Him as you should. You will not know Him. You will not know the blessings of eternal life that the Lord has actually given you to know. And you won't be able to store up those rewards and treasures in heaven. You won't be able to serve and glorify the one whom you love more than anyone else because the flesh will be fighting against you. If you want to know Jesus Christ, if you want to love God the way He loved Him, you have to do what it is the Lord tells you to do here. You have to do these things. Charge up your spiritual batteries. Preserve that power. Kill your flesh and put it to death. And by the way, it should be something that, that grows on us little by little, but I hope you understand this by now. You have to do this all the time. You can't take a break. You can't go on vacation, you know. It's, it's kind of like, um, you know, you make so much progress, and in order to reward yourself, you say, you know what, I'm just going to indulge in those things that, that I know I shouldn't be doing. And we do that. It's foolish. It's sinful. But that's what the flesh will tell us to do. And it'll set us back again. So we don't take breaks. We must continually pursue it, continually be seeking the Lord, continually preserving these things, continually fighting against our flesh. That's what Jesus was like. Of course, He didn't have the flesh to deal with, but He was continually pursuing the Lord, filled with the Spirit above measure. And He loved God in a perfect way. 
Now, what can you use to measure how well you're doing this, how much love you actually have? Well, you can do it in the same way that you would measure it in Jesus Christ. I mean, when you want to see how much Jesus loved God, what do you look at? You look at His life, and you see just how devoted He was to His Father. Jesus is the perfect example of devotion, isn't He? Uh, This is really what our Lord Himself said He was going to be like when He came into the world, because let's not forget, Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. It was His spirit He gave to the prophets in order to write down the Word of God. Well, what did He write regarding Himself? In our call to worship, we read this, I delight to do Your will, O my God, Your law is within my heart. Jesus said that His obedience to the commandments of God was the evidence and the measure of His love for the Father. John chapter 14, verse 31, listen. But so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. How does Jesus show His love for the Father? By obeying Him. His love was so strong for the Father that His love for Him basically trumped even His desire for the necessities of life, which is what we saw here in John 4, verse 34. My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to accomplish His work. As a matter of fact, His love and desire to serve the Father trumped more than just His desire for the necessities of life. It trumped His desire for life. He was willing to give up His life in His service to the Father. His Father commanded Him to lay down His life, and He laid it down so that He might bring you and me life if we simply trust in Him. Now, let me just mention, as I mentioned before, you know, just as we need to pursue the things of the Lord if we are to have this kind of love, Jesus, in His example to us, didn't love His Father in spurts. You know, He didn't just sort of go and stop, go and stop, take a vacation and, you know, sort of fudge, you know, and that type of thing on various occasions. But His love was constant. He was continually moving forward. His desire to, to love His Father and to fulfill His will was something that was not intermittent. He fulfilled the greatest commandment, which we've already seen, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength. Now, we would expect Jesus to do this because He is God in human flesh. That sets Him apart. We would expect Him to do this because He was filled with the Spirit of God above measure so that He was completely set apart for the Father's will. But we don't often expect that this is what we are to be like. I mean, God gave us a perfect example, an example of perfect love, and that is what He wants you and me to be like, which is why He gave us His Holy Spirit. I already told you that's why Jesus came into the world so that He might do the work necessary to give you His Holy Spirit. He gave you His Holy Spirit so that you might have this love in your heart for the Father and the Son, so that you would delight in doing His will, so that you would be a testimony to Him and to the world that would be seen that you love Him. By this, Jesus said, all men will know you are my disciples by your love. Now, not just the love for one another, which they certainly did, but love for the Father. He came into the world so that you would want to obey Him more than your necessary bread and that you would lay down your life for Him to love and to serve Him, not just with a part of your life, but with your whole heart, which means with all your love and affection, everything you have to give, you would love Him. With every thought that you think, You would use them all to serve Him with all the strength that He provides to you on a daily basis, however much that might be, with every faculty of your soul. That is the greatest commandment. That's what Jesus did. He did that as an example for you. He gave you His Spirit that you too might do this, that you might love and obey Him. And so Jesus says to you this morning, if you love me, 
you will keep my commandments. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And so I would ask you this morning, do you know Jesus in this way? Is this the kind of love that you have in your heart? Do you love him with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Well, none of us actually do to the extent we should, but do you want to? Do you desire that? And does your life show it through your obedience? When you are faced with a choice between submitting to God or to your flesh, when you have a choice between what gives you pleasure or what you know would give pleasure to the Lord, when you have a choice between obedience or disobedience, what do you choose? Do you choose what Jesus would choose? And you know what that is. Or do you choose what you want? Now, if you don't choose what the Lord wants you to choose, is, is, you know, why don't you? Is it because you don't love Him? Well, that may be true of some here. Maybe you don't. Maybe you don't love Him and you need to be saved. If that's the case, realize that God alone can give you that love. He's the one who gives His Holy Spirit. You need the Spirit of God. If He doesn't change your heart and give you this love so that you can trust in Jesus, you'll perish. There is a real hell, and it goes on forever. And the thought of it should make us shudder. It should make you shudder if you haven't trusted Jesus. Trust Jesus Christ. Turn from your sins and believe on Him. Ask Him for the Spirit of God so that you can. That's the only way to be saved. But realize, too, that even if you're a believer, we all struggle with love, don't we? It's never as strong as we want it to be. Well, if you're weak in this area, what can you do? Well, I've already told you. Stop drinking polluted water, for one thing. The polluted water of this world. Stop refreshing your flesh. You know, your flesh loves that, that poisonous water and just wants to continue to drink. You need to stop drinking it. And you need to begin drinking instead from the fountain of God's grace which is, of course, the means He's given us to get more of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said to the woman at the well, if you drink from this water, you'll have within yourself a well of water that, that, that it's just gushing up to eternal life. And He was speaking of the Spirit of God. We're told, I believe it's in John chapter 7. If we trust in Jesus, He will put a well of living water in us, but a well that we need to refresh in God's presence. If you want a stronger love, stop drinking the polluted waters of the world and drink the pure spiritual water that God provides by His Holy Spirit. Spend time with Him. Be refreshed by Him, by His Holy Spirit, so that your love for Him might grow, so that you can become more like Jesus Christ, that you might know Him more intimately. If you want to know Him, that is what you need to do. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's, let's ask the Lord to help us respond in the way that we should to these things. Again, remember, it has to go from here. It has to affect, you know, our minds. It has to come in. But from there, it needs to affect our hearts and incline our hearts toward Him. But it's got to work its way out in our lives. If it doesn't, then it really will do us no good. Jesus didn't walk around saying, I love the Father. Jesus went around showing that love by doing the Father's will. That's what we need to do. Let's pray that God would give us the grace to do that.